Alright, so I'm going to go over some ways of thinking about the Chandra and Skinner model that are insightful, and some of these are in their paper and some of them are not. So there's really going to be two things in this video. One is going to be a discussion of why this is an argument to have a government agency look at cost effectiveness and link something to cost effectiveness. And maybe that's going to be um, whether or not a technology is covered by the government insurance, maybe it's reimbursement rates. There, there's some different ways of integrating cost effectiveness into policy decisions about coverage of technologies, but this model gives an argument for something like NICE in the UK, which looks at cost effectiveness and decides whether the government will pay for it. And then the second thing I'm going to do in this video is to think about how this model might impact the evolution of technologies and which technologies get incentivized to be developed in the first place. So um, let's get started. And I'm not going to go over the model again. So look at my other video if you want to understand how the model works. But just to remind you, type 1 technologies are technologies that are cost effective for pretty much everybody who gets the technology. And the key with these types of, of technologies is that they're concave in their shape. And so the doctor's decision about what group of patients gets the technology is going to be very in line with who actually benefits a lot from the technology. And of course, we need to, um, we need to add costs. So we've got marginal benefit on the graph. Let's add marginal cost to both graphs. And the marginal benefit is the marginal benefit to society, but we can also think of it as people lined up along this axis, and the marginal benefit is the benefit to that particular person. And we've got the marginal cost. So the, the optimal societal decision here, according to the golden rule of economics, marginal cost equals marginal benefit, is to provide the surgery or the treatment to this number of patients. The doctor's decision rule, the doctor's decision is to treat this number of patients because they treat anyone who has a benefit greater than zero. And for type 1 technologies, these two groups are pretty similar. Whereas for type 2 technologies, the technology is really beneficial for some people, but there's a lot of people for whom the benefit of the technology doesn't outweigh the cost, and perhaps a lot of people who are getting the technology, even when the marginal benefit is very low and the technology is fairly expensive. So if we compare these two across countries and we have some sort of system for deciding which technologies could be covered. And maybe that system is, um, is looking at the actual marginal, marginal cost versus marginal benefit. Um, this, this theoretically is what an organization like NICE in the UK does. And this organization might look at this technology and might say, we're not going to cover it or we're only going to cover it for people who are likely to be in this group. And of course, then you have to determine who is actually in this group. Is it based on age? Is it based on um, secondary conditions? Is it based on severity of the illness? There might be a lot of factors that a doctor could look at to determine whether a patient is in this group. And the, the NICE would say, okay, we're only going to cover this technology for patients that we've decided it's really, really worthwhile. So that's how NICE operates. So in the UK, there's a lot more incentives to develop and adopt technologies that are type one, that are really beneficial to the people who get them. Whereas in the US, um, there could be an argument that a lot of the technologies that get adopted into our system are type two, and there's a lot of people getting them who don't really need them. So that's, that's the basic argument for a system like NICE, um, where the government is looking at cost effectiveness and integrating that into policy decisions. Now, there's lots of ethical arguments, there's, there's arguments both ways. Here and with this model, I'm just presenting the one argument, which is what is the argument for something like NICE. Now, I want to think a little bit about uh, the incentives to innovate. So there's some ironic things here. The example in the Chandra and Skinner paper of type 1 technologies, or one of the examples they gave, was HIV drugs, HIV medications. So people who, who have HIV have a very high value for taking those medications. But those medications have side effects. So people who don't have the, the illness yet, for those people it's not worth the side effects of the medication. 
So the doctor's not gonna recommend the medication to sort of anyone who's at risk. For example, maybe anyone who's sexually active could be at risk. Um, the doctor's gonna say, no, if you're just sexually active but you don't have HIV, this technology is not recommended. However, um, you could actually um, innovate on this technology such that it was basically the same drug, but you reduced the side effects. And if you did that, that would change the technology from a type 1 technology to a type 2 technology. Where if there's very few side effects to the drug, maybe it's recommended for people with HIV and also people who don't yet have HIV but might be at risk. So that's a little bit ironic that just reducing side effects could turn a technology from a type 1 into a type 2 technology. And what it means is there actually is a really strong incentive to reduce side effects in your innovation process. So if reducing side effects means you can tell doctors, well, everyone should have it or lots of people should have it because there's really no downside to giving the person this medication, you could get lots of extra doctors to adopt it for patients for whom it's, it's not that beneficial. Now, is that a good thing or a bad thing? I mean, you'd want innovators to try to reduce side effects. So that's that could be a good thing and probably is mostly a good thing. But if it leads to the expansion of how many medications every person on average is taking, that could have a negative effect, particularly in the long run. Because of course we know that this, this line is based on the doctor's perception of the patient's medical need. And for this group of patients out here who have a small benefit, a small positive benefit, it could be that the only evidence those doctors use to come up with this estimate that for this group of patients, the benefit is positive. The only research they've done, the only evidence they have is short-term evidence. So maybe if you take these drugs in the long term, it's going to affect things down the road that we have no idea about. Because once a drug's on the market, we we rarely get information about what's the long-term consequences of people on that drug. We just don't have a good system for collecting that information. And it could be if a whole bunch of drugs and a whole bunch of treatments go from type 1 to type 2 through a process that reduces the perceived side effects in the short run, we might end up over-medicating the population or medicating the population without realizing the long-term consequences. And so that's just an interesting thing that this model has gotten me to think about is what are the incentives over time to innovate in certain directions? Like if, if you have an innovation company, do you want to tell them, try to come up with a new treatment or try to expand the group of people who can get on this treatment. And that's called treatment expansion. It's where you expand the number of people who get a treatment rather than um, treatment substitution, which is where you, you develop a treatment that substitutes an existing treatment. So treatment expansion can be good, but there's also some risks involved, particularly in terms of potentially over-medicating or over-treating a population.